Hello again, and welcome to Wine 101 On The Road. I'm your host, Scott Sullivan, and today we are still doing our series in Southern Arizona. More specifically, we are in the Sonoida Elgin area, just off SR 82. Um, and we have a real treat because we are with um, an amazing winemaker, James Callahan, and uh, he is making big waves in the Arizona wine scene. So welcome. Thank you very much. It's uh, awesome to have you guys down here and uh, willing to dictate our sto story of what we do down here. You know, it's hard for Arizona to get a leg up in the industry already. So it's really nice to see a lot of interest in what we're doing and um, an appreciation for the wines that we're making. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Some really good stuff. And we're going to be talking about a lot of it. But before we do, I'd like you to get to know him a little better. And, and one of the best ways is reading his bio. Um, it's a great story as to how he got here because he's so young. Um, and yet he's been at some places that are pretty incredible. So can you tell us about your little Definitely. journey here? Yeah, man, it's, it's been a long journey. So we started off, or I started off, uh, back in 2005 as a busboy. And that's kind of where I, I had just turned 21 maybe a couple years prior. Uh, I forgot, two years prior, yeah. Um, and we, I was working as a busboy. I quit my job delivering pizzas. This is while I was in college, basically. And uh, I wanted to be a server, because I was like, hey, I could be a server. I could learn how to sell good wines and, and sell you know, high dollar food items at a table and make you know 20% or whatever in tips on a table. So I really got interested in wine based on that, not really knowing I'd become enthralled by it and have it become my passion. But uh, start off as a busboy and try to become a server. And then to be a server, um, you had to have prior experience. So I tried to study as much about wine and service as I could to get to the point where I could actually start getting shifts. Went from there, kept that knowledge I had. I realized, hey, I have this knowledge that you know, other people at my age didn't have. And I had a very, you know, after drinking all these wines and, and things that, you know, during my studies and at restaurants, I was like, wow, this is really cool. You can taste the difference between a wine from Italy versus France versus the United States. You know, the whole concept of terroir was new to me. So I just felt like it was something I wanted to pursue. And then came back to Tempe, uh, ASU, my alma mater, and kind of was at a point in my life where I really didn't know where to go. And I kept serving. Uh, I got my level one Psalm in 2007. And in that same year, I was approached by a winemaker who came to our restaurant and it was called Cafe Boa, it's still, it's still there. Uh, the winemaker's name is John Allen Bertner. He came there, he was working at a winery called Pure Vine in Tempe, which is an urban winery that specialized in making Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. So he came in, asked the owner if there's anyone that would be interested in being an intern there. And the owner of the restaurant volunteered me to uh, go out and do that. So in 2007, I had my first crush in Tempe at Pure Vine. Uh, we did, as I said, Cabernet Sauvignon. I stayed on there for a couple years, uh, became the cellar master, and then the housing crisis hit, and the winery was owned by a real estate development company, and subsequently it went out of business as well. Then turned around really quick, lined up a job in New Zealand, and went to New Zealand in the spring of 2010 where I uh, worked at a, w a winery called Paddy Borthwick Vineyard making Pinot Noir, which I had no experience making Pinot Noir in my life. Uh, at Paddy Borthwick, it was cool. You know, New Zealand's cool in general, right? But to make wine somewhere in a different country and see their style of doing it was even more eye-opening. Um, I did a lot of cool things there. I learned how to ride a motorcycle for the first time on my own and on the wrong side of the road. On the other side of the road, side of the exactly. road yeah. <laughs> you know, lots of stupid things, uh, but lots of fun things and, you know, made some great friends and, and learned some cool techniques about Pinot. And at the same time, um, I was looking to line up a job for the next uh, vintage, which would be the, Arizona, or the California vintage in 2010. And I was lucky enough to get selected to go to Costa Brown, which is a Pinot powerhouse in Sebastopol, California. Um, and I got the job there, worked really hard as an intern. Um, we made all Pinot, maybe a little bit of Chardonnay. And they ended up keeping me on as cellar master after the vintage was over. So I worked there between 2010 and 2012 as an intern for the first part and cellar master for the last part. Um, during my tenure there, we were able to get the number one wine with the Wine Spectator list, um, top 100 list. So that basically gave me like a free pass to go anywhere after working at that facility with those credentials. And 
I was looking at the wine jobs. I always wanted to come back to Arizona. It was my, actually it was my impetus all along to get into the wine industry was to do something here. I've been involved in the Arizona industry since 2006 um, as a taster and <laughs> someone that's curious, but uh, basically got, uh, found a job posting online for a winery in Wilcox called Eridus uh, for a winemaker. And I took that job and came to Wilcox in May of 2012. Uh, worked there for a year uh, as winemaker, started that facility up. Then I left that job in 2013 and started up Rune, where we are now, um, making wines, uh, pr predominantly Rhone inspired wines. Uh, and in 2014, I took, started taking on clients to kind of help finance everything. So I, in 2014, I made wine for Pillsbury Wine Company, uh, who I'd met while I was working at Eridus, and then Four Tales as well. Uh, in 2015, I began making wine, or sorry, 2016, I began making wine for Deep Sky as well. So it's another winery that's local to Wilcox and here in Sonoida. And uh, this year, I still just hired my first assistant winemaker and Rune is still uh, producing interesting wines and I'm learning something new every day, so. <laughs> he had me at uh, Gramercy. <laughs> and then, and Costa Brown, of course. But uh, in a short time, quite a, quite a array of uh, nice things to have in your yeah. resume. Yeah. But, but those things are California and those things are big and high class and polish, you know, some of the best Pinots <laughs> there are. And here we come down here and we're in a Quonset hut. <laughs> and we are off the grid. I wish I would have worn some camel because I mean <laughs> seriously, this is like underground winemaking. Um, and when you come down here, when you try these wines, you're going to be amazed at the quality and the character that, he, that he's able to get out of these grapes. So I'm really interested in how did you decide I want to do this out in southern Arizona off the grid. Yeah. I mean, really, how am I going to do this? I heard you poured your own concrete. Yeah, that's, you can tell. <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, it was after college, like when I was going through that time period where I was like, I don't really know what to do with my life. I was uh, either going to go back and be an architect and go down that path or make wine because I, I was really interested in both things. And I was, by making wine, I told myself, if I can make wine, I can build a building, I can build a space that people interact with, I can do something sustainable, I can do all the things I wanted to do through architecture. But I, I could do both of them. Whereas if I was just going to be an architect, I might end up having to build Best Buys or Walmarts or whatever. You know, I was like, I, I wanted to be doing something that was impactful. And uh, two years more of or three years more of school didn't sound like a lot of fun when the industry was booming. And um, so yeah, I, I chose wine, obviously. And uh, you know, I've, this has been kind of a dream come true for me. It's been my my life's work so far. At least my adult life's work is getting to this stage and seeing it happen and coming together so nicely. Not without speed bumps, mind you. I mean, it's not easy. It's not like someone handed me a check for a million dollars and said, build a winery. We started off with just one canopy outside and a porta potty. And uh, we've slowly been able to take the money we make from the business and build up the building, you know, put in, expand the wine operations, um, experiment with different types of winemaking, which we can get into later, and all sorts of cool stuff. So it's, it's been really fun and educational and engaging for me and I would I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else very cool yeah um, one of the things people talk about today you know with the organic and whether it's biodynamic or or what have you you've really taken a hold of all that whole concept and and you take it even a f step further with wild yeast and stuff talk about yeah. your what you want to make in wines what, what your belief is well I've never to be honest I've never made wines for anyone else that were similar in any way to the wines I make today. Like, um, we've used commercial yeast everywhere else. You know, when I worked at Costa Brown, we used one yeast for all the Pinot. We've used different yeast at other places, but no one's ever really taught me how to do things like on the wild side, I guess you could say. So that's all been a self-discovery thing. Um, and to me, the wine, you know, through making wines, when I first started in 2013, we did about half and half, half wild, half commercial. And I just was doing some experimenting. I try to experiment every year. Uh, I didn't want to ruin my whole vintage on some sort of guess and end up having a bunch of bad wine that I can't sell and then have everything fold up in front of me. So we made commercial yeast wines and wild yeast wines and through that process I realized I kind of really like the way the wild yeast wines show themselves and present themselves. Uh, they're more nuanced and complex in my opinion. Um, they are balanced and have just a sense of depth and juiciness to them that 
a commercial yeast wine doesn't have. It's almost like a bell curve for a wild yeast wine versus like a, a sharp point you know, on a graph for a commercial yeast wine. Whereas a commercial yeast wine might have more focus in one area. You might get a lot of red fruit, but this doesn't have everything else to fill in the gaps. And to me, it's, we do a lot of co-fermentation as well. And uh, I believe this, in conjunction with wild yeast, helps kind of add, uh, in, add in the missing pieces to the wine to make it more complex and make it more round and soft, uh, supple and delicate. All those things that a winemaker you know, strives for in his creations. So co-fermenting both white and red sometimes, but red and red, different red varietals red too, yeah, at yeah. the same time. At the same time, yep. yeah. Co-fermenting not just whites and reds, but reds and reds. We do, like this Grenache is a perfect example of that. Um, this Grenache we're drinking is a 2015 Grenache. It is all wild yeast fermented. And it's a mixture of uh, five different ferments of Grenache. Uh, one Grenache ferment was co-fermented with Syrah. Another Grenache ferment was co-fermented with a different clone of Grenache. Another Grenache ferment was uh, co-fermented with Pinot Gris. One was done whole cluster with uh, a different clone of Grenache. And then the last one was done with Viognier. I thought it had been six, I forgot, but <laughs> that's how many there were in there. So uh, the idea being we could taste all those barrels individually, see which ones we like, and in following years maybe repeat them. Um, but I think it lends kind of an interesting mixture to the wine that you don't just get from fermenting one grape on its own with one yeast. You know, we're trying to build up layers and, and balance and complexity, and um, it seems to work really well for, for what I've been doing. So. Now, now you're not, you haven't been here very long, but long enough to make some friends over in the next AVA. Arizona's <laughs> only actually second AVA in Wilcox. And so you're able to get some darn good fruit. Yeah. Tell us about some of the vineyards. Oh, man. So yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough to actually have lived there to experience the vineyards and, and see them on a daily basis working with them. You know, it's a lot of wine, winemakers and wineries in Arizona are, are distant from the Wilcox area where 80% of the wines are, made, are coming from. And um, it's really difficult to be there all the time to see all the things that are going on, you know, the different vineyard sites that might be, um, that might have interesting characteristics. And uh, I've just been lucky enough to be there and experience that firsthand and be on the ground for um, the last five years now, during five vintages, uh, working with those grapes. And I've been lucky enough to work with a Pillsbury Wine Company, who's my biggest supplier of fruit, who I also consult for winemaking. Um, his fruit, you know, I had it for the first time, I had his wines for the first time back in 2008 at Tempe Festival of the Arts, and I just remember tasting it and being like, this wine has some potential, you know, this, some good fruit here. So. Um, I really enjoy working with him as well. He's creative, uh, just like me, so we have a good time and work really hard to make really awesome fruit. Um, another great vineyard I work with is Deep Sky. Deep Sky is a winery that just opened up here in Elgin, but they have a vineyard in Wilcox, and they sell fruit to Page Springs and Chateau Tumbleweed and myself and a couple other clients. And Deep Sky is a, a vineyard that's on different soil types in Pillsbury's, more clayish. And we've, I've been working with them for the last two years um, and aiding them in their goal of getting the best wines they can on their vineyards. So they're, they're awesome to work with, you know, really energetic, passionate people. Um, Rumline Vineyard up the street from Pillsbury is awesome. They have planted their rows on an angle, on a bias, I guess you could call it, uh, which is interesting. It does interesting things with the fruit. Um, my first grapes from their vineyard were Graciano. I'm very, very pleased with the Graciano. It's a new varietal to me, and um, I've been kind of interested in it ever since I first made it a couple years ago. Um, and then lastly, Calibri, which is the most recent vineyard I kind of picked up in my portfolio of wines. And it's owned by Eric Lomsky at Page Springs, and it's situated up a really deep canyon in the Chiricahua Mountains, about in two hours from Wilcox. And the, the setting there is surreal. There's such, you just, it just exudes nature and exudes just kind of calm and tranquility. And the grapes there have the most fantastic flavors I've seen in anywhere in Arizona. Um, it's truly uh, a very special place. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to get some of that fruit to play with too. Now, is that dry farmed? No, there's, it's irrigated. It's irrigated, yeah. okay. It's on a north facing slope in the mountains, like 5,300 feet elevation, so it's really cool. And they don't get a lot of direct sun. Whereas like Wilcox is pretty much out in the middle of the plains. It's on what we call the Wilcox Bench, which is a really gentle decline going into the Wilcox Playa. But um, it's really exposed there, whereas Calibri is really kind of just one of a kind. It's situated in this little canyon. 
and it makes really unique wines too. So. What are the varietals growing up there? It's predominantly Rhone. I get, uh, I've, had, I've made Grenache from them, Mouvedre and Roussan so far, and Syrah. Um, but I think they have Cunois as well. They have, uh, oh gosh, I, Viognier. I think I'm missing a couple other varietals, some smaller plantings of other varietals. So this is very interesting for me, I hope for you. And we've got some wines here that he's producing. Um, and we'd like to talk about them and give you an idea of what he's producing and, and some of the flavor profiles. One of the other things we like to do, and just putting you on the mm -hmm. spot here, is if one of these wines, uh, a meal, or a, not a meal necessarily, but just a food pairing comes to mind, um, you can throw that in as well, because a lot of the people like to sure. buy your wine and make a di dish to pair together. Of course. Um, so yeah, basically we'll start off with the rosé. Um, we'll start from lightest to darkest. Uh, Rosé, this is my best rosé yet, and this has been kind of a personal challenge for me making rosé as a winemaker who makes predominantly red wines um, with a couple white wines in there. Um, rosé has been something that is challenging because it puts, it's very difficult in the cellar. Uh, the way I make it is a signet process where we take juice off the red wine ferments and take that juice and subsequently ferment it into a rosé. But the issue with that being is that you just pull off the free run juice at the, at the destemmer and there's not a lot of nutrient matter. Basically, it's just sugar water. So the yeast struggle. They create what we call H2S, hydrogen sulfide. And ma mitigating that and managing that in the rosé production has been quite difficult for me in, in learning experience. But this is the best one I've made yet. It's fantastic. Goes well with turkey. Um, this is a Thanksgiving wine all around. This is the season to drink this. This and when it's really hot. Uh, Viognier. Uh, Viognier for me has always been one of my wild yeast wines. Um, I started off doing a mixture of wild and commercial yeast. Um, it's all barrel fermented, about 50% stainless barrels and 50% neutral French oak. Uh, this particular Viognier in 2015, we switched over to all wild yeast, which basically gives you the effect of batonnage in the barrel for a longer period of time. Um, for those that don't know, batonnage might, is where you stir, stir the barrels to suspend the le leaves. Um, this, so when you do a native ferment, it keeps the leaves fermenting, or it keeps the leaves suspended longer, kind of get, uh, mimicking that effect, also creating more complex wines. Uh, Grenache, we just talked about um, in our last segment, but uh, awesome wine. This is another good Thanksgiving wine, good for lamb, stuff like that. Uh, Petite Syrah, this is a new one for me. This, I make this one in a, well, not a new one. This is the second year I've done it, but a new one being that it's wild yeast fermented. Uh, I make this in a coat roti style, so we co-ferment it with Viognier to kind of soften it up and give it a little bit less skin contact than the other red wines, uh, as Petite Syrah tends to become more tannic with more time on the skin. So I try to mitigate that by, by taking or limiting the time on the skins. Uh, another wine I have, which I don't have in front of me today, is my Wild Syrah, which is the wine we're known for, I'd say. That's the first all wild yeast wine that we used, that we made here at Rune. Um, it's a Syrah co-fermented in a coat roti style, but with three different starters. Uh, one would be Malvasia, the other's Roussan, and the other's Viognier. And we co-ferment those white grapes with the, red, with the Syrah and make a really complex and nuanced Syrah from that. Wow. <laughs> You've done your homework. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been a few years, yeah. So when you, um, when you came out and you were going to make all these different wines, um, what one was the one you had to make? Everybody that shows up somewhere says, I'm going to make the best whatever in the world. Did you have that well, or do you let the that's soil the thing, show is that you? Like Arizona, you go to California, you go to, you know, go, you go to Napa, it's Cabernet's place. You know, everyone makes Cab. It didn't always used to be that way. Mm -hmm. You go to Sonoma, and the predominance is Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, um, or I should say Russian River Valley. Um, you go to different places in France, and they have certain varietals. Arizona is still unmapped. You know, we have people that are planting new varietals, like Graciano, um, Alianico. There's all sorts of crazy varietals being planted where people are just trying to find out what works for them. My personal specialty, I'd say, is Rhone's, and I really like the way they produce, or the wines they produce here in uh, in Sonoida and in Wilcox. Um, so I'm kind of hanging my hat, at least for Rune, on, on Rhone varietals. But maybe in the future I'd like to experiment some more with other things, but probably put it under a different label, um, just so I don't kind of cloud this one up. You Seems know. like you're busy right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this name, the labels you ought to see, if you get a close-up of any of these labels or when you come, very neat, uh, each one of them. Um, how did you come up with the labels, but more importantly, the name? Yeah, so the name, you know, I, I studied history in school in ASU, so the name Rune comes from this language, a Viking language. It's a letter in their language. I was originally going to call the, winery, uh, the wine Saga, 
which is a story, like a Vi Icelandic like Viking story. Um, but that winery name was trademarked by uh, a French winery, so I couldn't. I didn't want to get involved with that. <laughs> so I found Rune was fine. It was free. It was close enough to kind of what I really wanted to do. But the whole idea is behind the, the wines and the, and the marketing is that each wine is different. So each bottle has its own. Each type of wine has its own character, and each bottle, each vintage, has its own um, uh, storyline. And you get to watch the character kind of travel through this fictional, science fictional story. And it ties in with wine and grapes. And it just kind of gives the person drinking it something different to remember the wine by than a number, you know, than a vintage. You know? so, and every wine is different. You can try all these wines. You can try past vintages, and they're all going to taste different. Um, we don't do anything the same twice. It might be similar, but not the same. So if, so if people want to come in and experience this, because it's really a great experience, um, you come down south on I-10 from Tucson and then come out on either 83 South or 90 South? Yeah, or? so if you're coming from Tucson, you want to take the 83 South, and then I'll take you to the town of Sonoida, um, hang a left at Highway 82, and we're about six miles down the road on the right-hand side on top of the hill. Just look for our giant uh, Kwanzaa hut which resembles an aircraft hangar. <laughs> and then if you're coming from the other direction on I-10, you would want to take Highway 90 south towards Sierra Vista and hang a right on 82 in Whetstone. It's about 12 miles down the road from there. And how would they get a hold of you if they wanted to look up your wines after seeing the show? The website's the best place, uh, runewines.com. Um, all my contact information's on there, email, um, phone number, et cetera. It's good. You're amazing. Yeah. This stuff, it, it, it truly is. He's a scientist, and uh, he's doing tre tremendous things. I'd like to shake your hand, yep. and thank you very yeah. much for letting us thank you. chat with you and uh, get to know you a little better. When you're coming down here, you've got to see this. There are some really unique things, obviously great natural wonders, great historic things in southern Arizona, but the wine scene is just coming on, and they are doing some things that uh, I think you'll be proud and happy you came. Um, I definitely want to let you know if you like this episode or any other episode on prescottmediacenter.org forward slash wine 101. And when you do that, it'll bring up a screen where you can actually scroll down and pick the episode you want to watch. And we have quite a few episodes, including all the ones we're doing now while we're in Southern Arizona. And uh, like I said, there's a wonderful, uh, just a plethora of things you can do while you're down here. Um, and hopefully, just maybe we'll see you on the road.